I know that you have appreciated the things that you've heard through the different teachers we've had in this course entitled Spiritual Formation. Somebody once said that you can know more about bridge building than 95% of the people in the world. The way you do that is read a book on how to build bridges because 95% of the people in the world will never read a book about building bridges. And I think that relates to our courses we're presenting in the Advanced Theological Studies program. We're bringing in experts, people who have experienced or written books on subjects, such as Norm Blackaby's book on character development. And you heard his lecture on how to develop a character that's going to reflect the honor and glory of Jesus. Then you heard the lecture by Chuck Davis, who is a pastor and professor uh, on spiritual warfare. And uh, he's written a book on that subject. So if you've listened to their lectures, if you uh, peruse through their books, you're going to know more about those subjects than most of the people who are serving in ministry. We are about to go into a, an interview between me and Dr. Norm Blackaby. The interview's on the subject of the role and ministry of the Holy Spirit. As I looked through all of the courses we have developed in the advanced study program, I realized we had not really focused uh, a time on the ministry and role of the Holy Spirit. So I sat down with Dr. Blackaby and I just began to ask him questions about what the you know, significance um, of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our, in our lives. Uh, there's a verse that talks about uh, out of our innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And Jesus was describing the work of the Holy Spirit as he indwells us and fills us. It's, he can't help but overflow and come out. And that is when we display the character of Christ in our everyday lives. So Dr. Blackaby will take us through this interview uh, describing what it means to uh, walk with the Holy Spirit or have him walk with us in our ministry. And then we're going to conclude this course uh, by a lecture uh, given by my mother, uh, Mrs. Evelyn Mangum. And she will be talking about how to finish well. I think all of us are young enough to where we're not thinking of ending too soon or uh, not, not too far in the distant future. But there are projects we're involved in or phases of ministry, chapters in our life that we need to finish well. So we can apply what she's about to share. She's near the end of her life, 91 years old. But we can apply it to our lives as we think about uh, reaching a birthday. Well, we've finished that chapter of the past year. Now we're moving into a new year. Have we finished well? If we're finishing a project in the EE work, uh, have we done it well? And have we kept a correct attitude in doing that ministry? So I know you're going to enjoy the interview. Uh, with Dr. Norm Blackaby and then the final lecture by Mrs. Evelyn Mangum. Let me share a story about uh, my mom that I think will describe or introduce uh, what kind of person, uh, person she is. Uh, I was teaching at a college some years ago and there was a student by the name of Renee Bowman. She grew up in Africa. Her parents were missionaries there for many years. Renee had gone off to college, and she had not gone back to visit her parents for a number of years. Well, she had an opportunity to go back as an adult, and she saw what her parents were doing from a different perspective. When she was growing up there, it just was part of life, and she didn't really see the significance of their ministry and their lives. Going back as an adult, she could really see what her parents had accomplished. One evening, she was sitting there with her parents in the living room. They were chatting and having a, f a fun time, telling stories. And then Renee turned to her mother and father and said, Mom and Dad, uh, when God calls you to heaven, what are you going to leave me? It was kind of a, a joking question, but uh, her mom thought a moment and she said, Well, you can have my cookbook. You see, her mom was thinking of the times they had sat around the table and the recipes she had written in her cookbook. And she was hoping Renee might remember some of those times around the table and the food that her mother used to cook. Her father, uh, Renee's father, looked at Renee and kind of jokingly said, well, you can have the old generator in the back. It still works. It's old, but it works. They laughed. 
And then Renee's father sat up on the edge of his chair, chair and he looked at Renee and he said, Renee, there's not much we can give you, but I'll give you the nations as your inheritance, the ends of the earth as your possession. Now go and make disciples. Well, as I think of my mom and my dad's influence on my life, that's what I think of. Uh, they have not gained much in wealth, and uh, my father is now in heaven. My mom probably will be going to heaven soon. And uh, they're not going to leave any inheritance to us. Uh, but one thing they have left to their kids is the nations as our possession, the ends of the earth as our inheritance. And they've taught us, and by example, modeled to us that we are to go and make disciples. So as we can come to the near the end of this uh, course on spiritual formation, I trust that uh, you will be challenged to Im implement these different aspects of character development and spiritual warfare, how to, how to overcome uh, binding that which is in heaven, binding here on earth with the power and work of the Holy Spirit. And then looking at uh, how we can make sure we finish well for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. Well, Norm, I uh, appreciate you taking the time to come and teach the course, uh, part of the studies on spiritual formation. And uh, what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is just kind of pick your brain, let you talk a little bit about the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, we in EE have such a strong emphasis on the evangelism part of it, and we know it's the power of the Holy Spirit that needs to be evidenced in our life and our ministry. But I, I realized in our spiritual formation course, we don't, there's often references to the Holy Spirit and the need for the filling of the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit and so on. But uh, I thought it would be helpful just for you to give some of your own experience, what you saw in your dad, uh, what you've seen in ministry, uh, both in church ministry and in teaching, uh, how the Holy Spirit has helped you and how you could advise how EE leaders could... Uh, tap into the, the power and work of okay. the Holy Spirit. I guess uh, let me start with kind of a basic approach or understanding that I would take. So the first thing is when I look at the Old Testament, well, we know we have a trinity. So we have three parts of the trinity. So the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So I would look not, a, not as a dispensational approach, but as a, just looking at the Old Testament, you have your Father as a primary part of the trinity that you'll see it's his work as the Father initiates the work and we know that the whole Trinity is there. We know from the Gospel of John that the Word is created to the Word. But, but you see, the Father is kind of the main part of the Trinity that we see working in the Old Testament. When we come to the Gospels, uh, we'll see that it's the Son and that our salvation is secured through the sacrifice of, of Jesus. So we see the role of the Son. In our, our, and so that whilst the Father's plan is worked out through the Son and He's the one that gives his life, and it's his blood, and, it's, and he's, he pays the debt, and it's his perfect sacrifice. But then when you start looking like the final discourse of John, so John 13 through 17, you'll see in that final discourse, those teachings, you see Jesus making these references to the helper. And he makes this amazing statement, because you think about it, everything you have in the Son. It, I mean, you know, it's Jesus. How do you get any better than Jesus? And so, and he said, and you think about it, you know, we look back, you know, how incredible I was walking with Jesus and hearing the teachings firsthand from Jesus like that. But he says, it's better that I leave so that the helper can come. And, and, and you have this picture of him ascending, but he needs to ascend. So, and not that they don't co coexist, but he says he needs to ascend to heaven. And he says, but the helper is going to come. That's kind of a, a neat word he uses to describe the spirit. But if you look at John 14 through John 16 and his understanding of the role of the helper, um, you start wondering, okay, well, this is pretty incredible. If, it's, if, if we're better off that he leaves and the helper comes and works with us, then what in the world does that look like? Because it's, it's pretty amazing for them with the son. Then you come to Acts, and you come to Acts chapter 2 and Pentecost. And you, you see Jesus telling the disciples, you know, you wait until power comes on from, and you look at that whole thing. And then Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost, the Spirit comes. And you see a radical transformation. And 
when you're looking, if, if Acts, you know, we call it Acts of the Apostles. It's really not. It's because some of the apostles aren't even mentioned. In fact, some the majority of the main characters are in there are not even apostles. I mean, Paul is, but he's not one of the original 12. But you look at a transformation, and really the book of Acts should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit, not the Acts of the Apostles. And that whole fleshing out of the expansion of the early church rested on the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so I think when we start, so that's my understanding. So, so you're, you're, it's the Father's plan. It's our salvation secured through Christ, not diminishing any part of the Trinity, but, but how you live out the Christian faith is in the Spirit. And doesn't take away from any three. All three are essential. All three are part of the Godhead. But how do we live this life out? It is lived out in the Spirit. And the Christian life is a human impossibility to live out apart from the Spirit. It cannot be done. And so we see the Spirit coming and taking residence in us. I guess maybe and maybe just kind of a picture, and then we can, we can hit some specific scriptures and examples. But think about Peter. So at the, at the crucifixion, you got the great Peter, you know, he's, he's brash, he's a you know, leader of men, you know, he's probably the union rep for the fishermen. And yet, when he denies Christ, who does he, who is it that turns the great Peter away? It's a, a young girl, isn't it? A slave girl. And, on, and Peter's sitting there watching his Lord, and a servant girl, slave girl, says, weren't you with him? And he denies and denies and uses curses. And, but so take that picture. Then look at Acts chapter 2 when the Spirit comes. Then look at Peter before the Sanhedrin. I mean, you've got a slave girl who's not anybody in society and it turns Peter back. You've got a Sanhedrin that holds his life in his hand, who are the ruling order of the Pharisees and the top, you know, the top leadership of the Pharisees. And you look at the boldness. Just, and, and they're astounded. They, you know, we know these men, how can they speak like this? They knew they'd been with Jesus. So you look at the radical transformation when it when you see before the Spirit comes and after the Spirit comes, you're just in the life of the disciples. You look at that bold witnesses. I think that's telling right there. But then you look at the role of the Spirit. So Paul gives us a lot of things on the Spirit. Uh, you're thinking like Romans 5.5. 5. It says, you know, the, you know, it talks about, you know, hope in Christ will never bring disappointment. Why? Because the love of the Christ is poured out in your heart through the Spirit. And, and you look at Corinthians and you look at the role you know, what says the Spirit convicts us of sin and of righteousness. So walking this, we're talking about spiritual formation. How do you walk in your spiritual formation? How do you walk in your intimacy with Him? It's the Holy Spirit's role. He's been assigned by the Father to convict us of our sin, which is essential because we're not able to repent if we're not convicted of it. And He's also there assigned to convict us of righteousness, to let us know we're doing good. I think of... Uh, we're looking at interceding. So when you don't even know the words to share and you're in moanings and groanings and not even understanding, the Spirit has been assigned by the Father to intercede and go before the Father when you can't even put into words and intercede back and forth in the Father when you're in, trying to even have an understanding how to, how to express what's going on in your life when you're trying to walk with God. You look at the direction he gives. and You look at Paul when he's wanting to go one way and then Spirit leads him another way. And you look, just all the empowerment of the Spirit... They, they, it's just an absolute uh, clear, especially starting in Acts chapter 2, and you start watching how the Spirit empowers them, that you cannot live this life without the Spirit. You cannot do the work of God without the Spirit. It, it's not diminishing the Father or the Son. They're all essential. They all are one and distinct. But I think some, some of our traditions probably, we kind of discount the Spirit a lot. I hear a lot of people pray, you know, in the Father and the Son, and then they forget the Spirit. Thinking, you know, last time I checked, he's an equal part of the Trinity and essential in how we walk with him. Does that help kind of give you my, kind of my basic understanding? Absolutely. Do you, do you want to maybe redirect me if you need to? Or? <laughs> no, that's ex excellent. Because you touched on how vitally important it is for us as believers and EE workers to walk in the Spirit. In practical terms, how does that happen? I think in EE we have a lot of action-oriented people. We do, we do uh, so much, and there, the time where we contemplate or submit or, or surrender and ask for the filling of the Spirit, the, the anointing, His leading, uh, maybe you could just discuss in practical ways how do we apply okay. the doctrine of the work of the Spirit. I see. Like, my understanding... 
you know, the Christian life is not about doing, it's about being. And so we do have a lot of doers. And, and not again, it's not a bad thing, is it? I think of you know, Mary Martha, she gets in trouble the first time for getting mad she's doing too much, but the next time you see her in that story, she's still doing, but she's got the right heart. And so we've got to have our, our Marthas, or a lot of stuff wouldn't get done. But it, and I guess if, if we understand that the Holy Spirit has been assigned by the Heavenly Father to dwell in us, to empower us, to equip us. I mean, look at the fruits of the Spirit. I mean, it's, all of that is coming out of living out of the Spirit. So we, we hear He intercedes for us. He gives us direction. He convicts us of sin and righteousness. Uh, and you look at all, all of that role, we, we better learn how to stop and listen to Him. And one of the ways He does is He t- says He takes the Word of God and, and He opens those, the Word of God up in an understanding and applies it to us. Um, if we're not spending time, significant time with him, having him take the scriptures and apply it specifically, write down our heart, convicting us of sin and righteousness, then we're simply doing activity. And I don't know anywhere where God calls us to activity. Do you, like, do you, it's called your relationship. And out of the relationship, you serve him as a, as a servant or slave. And, and I think of, um, uh, at the, it's at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, where these people are saying, Lord, Lord, do we, do all these things in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We did all this. We preach your name. And what does he say to him? He says, you know, depart from me, you doers of iniquity. I don't even know you. It's not about activity. And, and so it's absolutely essential that we relate to the Spirit to know what's on the heart of God, to know what we're supposed to be part of. Because nowhere in the Scripture do you see a servant, or outside Scripture, does a servant just go and do activity for the Master. The servant listens to the master and does what the master is telling you. And, and we see the example Jesus said, the words I speak are not mine, they're the Father's. If you see me, you've seen the Father. The actions he did were not his, they were the Father's. And you see that intimate relationship was the Spirit that helps us in that intimate relationship. We're, we have Christ riding, residing in us, we have the Spirit residing in us, but the Spirit's going to help us know how to, how to interact and relate to understanding the will of God and the purposes of God. So I guess for me, the practical uh, for as a pastor or a ministry is I've got to relate to the Spirit because if I'm not, I'd, I'm going to be spinning my wheels or doing something in left field instead of what God intends. Now, can we get absolutely caught up in really good things that have nothing to do with what God asks us to do? Yeah. And, and I, I'm one who believes that when God knows every one of our days, I take like Psalms 139. If he knows every one of your days before they come about, he fashioned you together, he knew your days, he knit you together. And you look at, you know, he knows every, has every hair in your head counted, has every day before they come apart. Then clearly, if, if he says he has that intimate relationship with us, then he has our day planned out for us. And, and not the silly part where should I get a jar, glass of milk, or, you know, people try to take that extreme, but a basic understanding, walking with him in your daily walk, then if he knows that for me and has a plan and a purpose for me, and I would, I would argue a specific plan, then I have to know him and I have to relate to him, or I'm just doing activity. And, and I don't want to do activity. I'm, I'm tired enough. Aren't you? We're, we work with E. You said with E.E., you're tired. We don't need to be doing activity. We need to be doing what's on the will and the heart of God. How do you know what's on the will and the heart of God? You relate to the Spirit. And, and uh, you've been in ministry long enough. How many people do you know that have been burnt out in ministry? Okay, how do you get burnt out in ministry? I mean, it may sound kind of mean in some ways, but... You get burned out of ministry by not relating to the Spirit and getting caught up in activity. It doesn't mean it's not hard walking with the Spirit. I mean, I'm sure Paul, when he talks about burying the scars and the marks, and you look at him being shipwrecked and bit by a serpent and stoned and the walking, the traveling, and the nakedness and the clothing and the wealth and the poverty and everything goes through, he didn't have it easy. On the other hand, you don't catch a burnout on Paul, do you? Even at prison, you got this. You read his letters, and you're amazed. Like he's so he's writing to the Philippian church, and he's in prison, and he's encouraging them. How does he do that? Life in the Spirit, and and so it's an a, an empowerment, but it's an empowerment to do the will of God, not an empowerment to do activity. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Like, and I think in EE we could get caught up in doing all the good things, but not the right thing. And it's the Spirit that helps you do the right thing, and it's the Spirit that helps you walk with Him. Then you see the fruit, and see, and if you're doing what's on His will, then you see the empowerment. But I, th- I think probably at times, for me, if I'm getting really weary, then I'm wondering, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Mm-hmm. 
Not, not, not tired, not physically tired, but weary in my soul. Does that make sense? Because there's, there's a difference. You'll be tired serving God. Obviously, we know that. But you won't be weary in your soul. There'll be a refreshing and a renewing. So it seems you're saying an evidence of the work of the Spirit in our life is just the faithful, constant walking, relying on His strength. So when you could, we think of the work of the Spirit, uh, we think you, there's got to be a yielding, so there's this empowering, so we go out and do these great things for God. So is uh, the, the yielding and empowerment something that will automatically happen by the filling of the Spirit? Or is it just that consistent no. walk and faithful service? No, I think it all hinges on a passage like Luke 9, 23 and 24. You know, the watershed for the Christian life. So if anyone desires to follow after me, deny himself, take up his cross, and follow him. And there's, a, there's going to be a denying yourself and resting in the Spirit. And I, and I think there's just going to be a, I think there's a daily, constant struggle to do that. Our self is going to, is our, the Spirit is going to, the Spirit is not going to direct you to do what you want. You know, if we're honest about it, he's not really interested in what you want, is he? He's interested in what the Father wants. And so the Spirit's not going to, so you're going to find a constant struggle. Every t- I, my understanding, for, for myself personally, if I'm relating to the Holy Spirit, I'm going to be constantly making adjustments in my life because I'm relating to God. And God's mind and heart are so beyond my understanding. And the Spirit will help me understand and stir my heart and give me wisdom. And he'll take the scriptures and pull the scriptures up and apply them to my life, you know, like a sword cutting right down the middle of your heart and your life. But... But every time I encounter God, I encounter the God, the Holy Spirit. I'm encountering God, who is His thinking is as far as the heavens are from the earth from mine. And I'm going to have to make adjustments, and I'm going to be being in, um, convicted of sin and of righteousness. Not, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. The Spirit's going to be coming along me and say, "Norm, this is where I'm heading. You need to make these adjustments." So one of the ways I I kind of gauge my own life if I'm walking in the Spirit. And walking with Father is, am I making constant adjustments and changes in my life towards him? Because it's also the spirit that's been assigned, what, to conform you to the image of Christ. So if I'm, if he's, and and think about that. So if the Heavenly Father has assigned the Holy Spirit to conform you to the image of Christ, is he going to lay down on his job? No. So one way I look at my life is if I'm not continually being shaped and chipped and chiseled and adjusted towards Christ, then I'm not walking with the Spirit. Because I can assume that he's not stopped doing his job because he's part of the Trinity and he and the Heavenly Father have an agreement in there and however that works in our theology. So I know he's still doing that. So if I'm not adjusting, then the problem's with me. I don't get all depressed on that and say, you know what? Okay, then I need to repent. And guess what? The Holy Spirit's been assigned to convict me of sin and righteousness. So he'll convict me and he'll help me. And when I don't even know what's going on and I'm making justice, then the Holy Spirit's been assigned to intercede to the Father and search my heart and go between and help me understand. And then he'll take the scriptures and bring them alive and specifically apply them down my life. I just think walking in the Spirit is the most practical part of the Christian life. I don't know why um, we sometimes we make it so difficult. But it's, it's, he says he's a... Jesus said he's a helper, and so that means he's going to be helping us. And sometimes we want well, to understand, or I don't see. We don't have, we don't under, have to understand. We just have to accept he's going to be helping us, and then release in that denying self and walk with him. Uh, is that is that helpful? Because yeah, I just kind of my own. And I think uh, uh, working through the <clears throat> way you've described it, you've made it such a simple thing, not simplistic, but profoundly simple, and uh, just walking in the leading of the Spirit and then making those adjustments. But maybe as a way to summarize, what advice would you give to E leaders that are viewing this interview with regards to uh, the work of the Spirit in their life, okay. in their ministry? I guess I would say at all costs, you have to make sure you're walking the Spirit. Don't let anything get in the way of, of severing that relationship. And, and, and let's, let's be honest with this ourselves here. We all, we all sin, and we all know we're not walking with God, don't we, for the most part? Like, I don't, we, don't, I don't, we don't need testimony from you because you want to keep your job. I'm just but but if, if you think about this last couple months, there's 
I'm sure if you're if you're human, you lived on this earth this last couple months, you did something you knew that was a violation of God's law, something that you, it was a sin. But you know you did it. You know it was wrong. And you know it hurt the relationship. And so don't continue. You're going to do that, but continue immediately. Say, I don't want anything getting between me and the Spirit. Now, and what's the easiest, most simple indicator that you're walking in the Spirit? There's this little chapter in Galatians that's really helpful, isn't it? You know, it's not the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, impatience, angry at my wife, you know, frustrated in traffic, you know, peace, kindness, self control. I, 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 I guess my simple understanding is we see the sin that happens in Genesis and you see in the fall in chapter 3. And then you watch this whole plan of the Father working all the way through the Old Testament to try to right the wrong and bring mankind back to their relationship. And you see this, he, his son dies on the cross in the New Test, in the Gospels. He, he's ascended up, he gives us the Spirit, he gives us his Holy Word. For us, we have 2,000 years of Christian history, people walking with him, and I, I don't see all that happening. So then Jesus can say, or the Father can say, now I'm going to make it difficult to know how to walk with me. And I think we make it so complicated, but he, why would he go through all this trouble because he loves us and then say, but now I'm going to make it hard to know how to walk with me? I think sometimes we complicate stuff because we, in our mind, we think it should be complicated. And I think, is it, is it, let me write, is it 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians 11.3? 2 Corinthians 11, 3, where um, Paul says, I fear lest somehow you be deceived, like Eve was deceived from the serpent, from the simplicity that's within Christ. And I think we get deceived from the simplicity. It is, if you're in EE and you're serving God and you're wanting to share the gospel, you can't tell me that you don't know when you're not walking in the Spirit. You know it in your heart, and the Spirit will testify in your heart against you, not in a mean way, not in, that, in a way that the Heavenly Father says, I love you, I want you to walk with me, I want you to experience the fullness of God, therefore I'm convicting you of this, it's wrong. And let me tell you and remind you about this little passage in 1 John 1, 9 that says, if we confess our sin and repent, he's faithful to forgive us and restore us and cleanse us so that we keep walking with him. So I think, I think we need to take the time to understand the Holy Spirit and the role of the Spirit. I would take my concordance, and, and for me in my Bible, you look in the back, there's a whole list of verses related to the Holy Spirit. I want to make sure I know them, and I go through and think through them. And, if I, and I want to remind myself of them. So I just write and write my Bible. These all relate. But you have a concordance. We can go through. I would start looking through. And, and, and also, what are you missing out for? If you're an EE and you're not understanding everything the Spirit has been assigned by the Father to do for you, you're missing out on some really good stuff. You know? Because this ministry can't be, I mean, we don't want to do it apart from the Spirit. So let's learn as much as we can about the Spirit and how he empowers and how he directs and how he guides and how he shows us his will and then how he empowers us to do it. But if, but I'd, I would say good advice, that's long advice. But go take the book of Acts, starting in chapter 2, and look at the radical difference every time you see what this, the, a mention of the Holy Spirit. You want to see God-empowered ministry? Look at the book of Acts. You know, what a witness. Uh, you know, and, and, and you look, how many of those people were that, you know, it, it is called, it should be called the book, the, the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And just go through and look through every time you're going to see a reference to the Holy Spirit and what the Spirit did and the empower, empowering of the Spirit and realize those people have no more better or different walk with God than we do. We have the exact same Lord exact same salvation, exact same Heavenly Father, exact same Holy Spirit, exact same equipping. They have no advantage over we. We, we probably have advantage over them. We've got 2,000 years of Christian history to add to that, that we watch and can testify of the activity of God and, uh, and then hold on. Because I think it's... Um, and I guess there's one other little caveat is that... Uh, Words of advice, if you do that, assume that the Holy Spirit is going to put you in places that are going to stretch you beyond anything you can imagine. But it'll be fun. You know, the Lord's been so good to me, and he's followed me from day one. Now, I am 91 years old, and I'm supposed to talk on finishing well, but I want to tell you, I'm not finished yet. I may have a few more years, and I hope 
that every day will be uh, for his glory, that I might live to please him and to honor him and to be used of him. That's what it's all about, nothing else. I had some wonderful steps to walk into or to follow. From the time I was a very little girl, I knew about Jesus. Now, it started even before that. My father and mother were in Greenville, Ohio. He was well-to-do, and she was a school teacher. And there was a big job to be done because he was being prepared to be the director of a company. And his father was going to put it all into his hands. So everything was exciting. He drove the first car in Greenville, Ohio, and he really was the big shot, the good life. Then one day he was invited to a small service in the back of a shoe store. And he and mother went, and they heard a preacher, a visiting preacher, and the preacher told about his work and what his heart was all about, what, how he felt uh, the future would be. And then he said one, one sentence, Arabia is closed to the gospel. When my father heard that, he said, well, I'm going to open it. But he didn't say anything to mother. They went home and he thought about it for a few days and finally he went into mother and he said, Lola, what do you think about going to Arabia? I thought you'd never ask, she said. Of course, God's called me too. So <laughs> things began to happen. They had two homes, one in Greenville, one on Lake Erie. And so the first thing he did was go to his father and he said, Dad, I'm leaving. I'm going to Arabia to take the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're a fool, he said. If you want to go out there and spend the rest of your life in the desert, go ahead, but I absolutely put you out of my will. That's it. Daddy went out, told mother, they sold their home, they took off for Bible school in Nyack, New York. They studied hard. They had two little girls, Miriam and Marjorie. Marjorie sat on their lap in school and Miriam went to first and second grade. Then the time came when mother had news for dad. He came home. She said, Dad, Grady, uh, that's my husband, uh, George, we're going to have a baby. No, he said, no, he knew the rule. The rule was you could not go to the field with more than two children and they already had two children and here a third was coming. He wept thinking his whole future was finished. Then he decided, I'm going to write a letter. And he wrote a letter to the board of managers. Please have mercy. I've got to go to Arabia. I've got to open Arabia to the gospel. Please, please make a change. Don't keep to the rules on this. Make an exception for me. And then they waited. And they waited. Finally, the letter came. But he couldn't open it. Absolutely couldn't open it. I can't open that letter because my whole future, I believe, is right here. God's will for my life. And I'm not willing to stay in America. He called a friend of his, and they went to the altar in Nyack at the chapel. And he sobbed, and he wept. Oh, God, help me to be willing to stay in America. Poor Mr. Brooks, kneeling next to him, kept saying, Can we open the letter yet? Not yet. I'm not willing to stay. Can we open the letter yet? No, not yet. Uh, can we go now? No, we can't go. I'm not willing to stay in America. So he sobbed at the altar. Finally, he said, all right, I'm going to open this letter. And whatever it says, that's God's will for my life. They opened the letter and it said, we're going to make an exception for you, George Braden. You may prepare to go to Arabia, actually to Jerusalem, and from there go as far as you could into the Arabian border. Daddy was sky high. 
and mother was so happy. They went back and sold the home on, the, on Lake Erie. But there were a lot of problems, a lot of S-curves, as we call it these days. Scary times. Because just before they were to get onto the train to go back to Greenville, my sister Miriam was playing school with us to entertain us, and she put holes into a beautiful oil painting on the wall that belonged to the people that had the apartment. This is a house. This is a tree. This is a lake. And every time she'd say this, there was another hole that went into that beautiful oil painting. Well, Daddy had put aside $50 to take us back to Greenville. That was the last of his money until he sold the home on the lake. He said, I'll have to go tell the owner of the apartment. So he ran to the apartment. He said, my daughter's ruined that. How much did it cost? $50. He pulled out the last $50 he had and gave it to the man. And then he came back and he said, all right, let's go. We got to get the train. Mother said, are you crazy? We don't have any money to buy the tickets. He said, God will provide. And so they went, and they went down to the train station. Somebody took them down with all of the baggage, and there we sat on a bench, all in a row. Daddy, Mother, Miriam, Marge, and I was in Mother's lap. Sitting there waiting for God to do something. Pretty soon, a little lady came along, and she said, Oh, what a beautiful baby! Uh, where are you going? I said, We're going to Greenville, Ohio, and then to Arabia as missionaries. Oh, would you mind if I paid for your tickets to go back to Greenville? Oh, we wouldn't mind a bit. And she paid for the tickets. And she was so happy to do it. And the rest of the family, mother was absolutely excited and thrilled and shocked. They went back, said goodbye to everybody, and took off for Arabia. Daddy was so anxious to get to the Arabian border. Mother was a, had been a school teacher and played the piano for the silent movies. The horses come, she'd plop, plop, plop. When the, when the um, uh, love story went, mm, I love you truly, and oh, she, she played for that. And here she was on her way to Arabia with all of her petticoats. They arrived in Ma'an. If you've been to Petra, you go through Ma'an to get to Petra. And then from there, you go down to Aqaba. So here we were in Mahan. I never went to school till I was nine years old. There was no school. But I sure had a lovely bunch of friends. I loved the people. I loved the food. I loved the children. I loved the tents. I loved the camels. You come to my house in, in uh, Kissimmee, Florida, and you'll see a lot of camels there. I love camels. And I just think about the wonderful childhood I had, thinking we're here because my dad and my mother want to tell everybody that Jesus loves them and that there's hope for them. So I had shoes to, uh, shoe prints to walk in. I saw God heal people. I saw God work in marvelous ways. And he, my sister with epilepsy healed instantly. I died. The doctors in, our, in Beirut said she's dead. For hours and hours I was dead. And Daddy said, we're going to stay here and pray. If God has a plan for her life, he will raise her up. And in the morning I threw the covers down and I said, I want some ice cream. And I've been healthy ever since. But let me tell you something. I want one thing, and that is that I might glorify God. And I know that I can work my head off, but unless the Holy Spirit works through me to the hearts and lives of people, I have nothing to brag about. But it's he who works. It's he who touches. It's he who changes lives. Now, that's why I want to base my thinking today on a tent. Being in Arabia, loving the tents, I want to base my th thoughts on the tent. Because when I think of EE, -E, I think of a huge tent, a tent with ropes that go all the way around the world. A thrilling, a thrilling thought. 
that wonderful verse, enlarge the place of thy tent, stretch forth the curtains of thy habitation, spare not, lengthen thy cords, strengthen thy stakes, and you will spread out and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. That's my verse. And he promised with the job description that he would be upon us and guiding and leading us. So I grew up in, in the Arab lands and loved every minute. But I had to go away to school, into Jerusalem. And I would think about the tents and I would think about going home. And, but let me tell you something. There was a lady from, from, New, from uh, Vermont that came out to take care of all the missionary kids. And she took care of us all and taught us the scripture. Verse after verse after verse. I was with her eight years and we learned a new verse every day. Now, except Sunday. That was review day, which was worse. Matthew 5, 6, 7, Hebrews 11, Romans 8, on and on and on, one psalm after another. But we hid it away in our hearts and later we thanked her, not then. But this is the word that we're trying to get out to the ends of the earth. Out, onward, outward. We are the cords of enterprise by which the gospel is sent to the ends of the earth. We are the fibers of human hearts woven on the loom of personal consecration in the secret place of God. That's who we are. This wonderful tent that goes outward, onward, outward to the ends. And that's EE. -E. That's EE. -E. That's the way it works. It's thrilling to see. Especially when you get my age, you can look back and you can see those ropes that go all the way around the world. You know, it was Daddy to Miriam, my oldest sister. Miriam and Harry went to Cambodia. They went to Cambodia's missionaries. He got polio. They went to the Philippines just in time to be taken captive by the Japanese. They were in prison for three and a half years. And after that, they went back to Cambodia. And then Cambodia closed with Pol Pot coming in. And they had to leave. Then they went to Beirut. And as soon as they got to Beirut, they won joy to the Lord. And joy brought her husband to the Lord. And then he was, he was the um, Metro Hotel of the Phoenicia Hotel in Beirut. And he at first was very anti anything to do with religion, but he's on fire for God and a leader for him today. And he won the fellow that took his place when he left to go be the preacher and to be an evangelist. And the person that took his place won another man and he was sent when the Phoenicia Hotel blew up uh, in a war and there wasn't anything left of the Phoenicia, they sent him to Saudi Arabia. So here we go, mother, Miriam, Joy, her husband, on and on. I know the names, but I don't want to say them uh, on TV. But anyway, it, on and on and on, all the way to Saudi Arabia. Now, Grady was area director at that time, and we were traveling around the world, and I wanted to go so badly. So we sold our cemetery plots so that I could go along. I would figured we wouldn't need cemetery plots for a while. So I got on that plane with Grady and we arrived in Beirut and here was the fellow from Saudi up in Beirut visiting his parents. And he said, I have, a, I have a brother in Hong Kong that needs to hear about Jesus. Is there anybody in Hong Kong that can go tell him about Jesus? He has a hair place that's called the Clip Joint. Now please, could, could you find something? Grady said, yeah, I know somebody. He says, uh, Tom Stebbins is out there and I'll write him a letter. So when we got on the plane to go to Holland, he wrote, Dear Tom, there is a young Arab fellow in, in uh, Hong Kong. He has a clip joint place for hair, ladies' hair, dues, and uh, oh, they're very anxious that you go win him to Jesus. So Tom Stebbins gets the letter. He was in the middle of an EE program. So after they finished their classes, I, I they you send people there out. Oh, you go here, you go here, you go over here, and you and you two ladies, you come with me. We're going to go find the clip joint. They said, oh, we go to the clip joint. Now, there are hundreds and hundreds of hair places in, in Hong Kong. But these two ladies went to the clip joint. So she said, let me introduce us, because I, uh, 
I've been wanting to tell them something. I've been wanting to tell them about Jesus. And they keep asking me why I'm so happy. Now we can do it. So Tom and these two ladies went to the clip joint. See the, see the, see the ropes? On and on and on and on. Borders make no difference. It keeps going in every direction. And I see this huge, marvelous tent. Of course, there has to be a pole. Now, what's the pole? The pole is Jesus Christ. The one and only, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He is the pole. God the Father, who purposed our redemption. God the Son, who purchased it. Purposed, purchased. And God the Holy Spirit, that applies it to our hearts. Our redemption, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. The El Elyon, the Most High God. You know, if you put a bunch of baskets on your head, the top basket is the Elyon basket. Well, God is the Most High God. He is the center post in this marvelous tent that I see that goes around the world. El Elyon, the Most High God. El Olam, the God of the ages, the God of successive ages, the God from the beginning and the end. The Alpha, the Omega, that's the post. Have you ever been in a tent? Have you ever put your arms around the center post? It's as smooth as glass because it's had so much touching, so much touching, so much strength, so much power. And you know, that tent pole goes with the tent when they move the tent, that pole, because there's not a whole lot of wood out there. And you get a good pole and a good strong pole, you take it with you, drag it with the camels, and you put it up, and it's solid. And then the ropes can go out. The ropes can go here and there, and it happens all the time. Just a couple weeks ago, uh, or a couple months ago, time goes so fast for me, I was having my nails done in, in uh, a Vietnamese place, and there was a guy sitting there and I knew he was from Vietnam, but I knew he wasn't Vietnamese. And so I sat down, and I said, uh, where are you from? He said, Vietnam. I said, Vietnam? Where in Vietnam? Pleiku. I said, I, I lived in Pleiku. That's my city, too. That's my town. It was Tail Village. It was very small then. And he said, oh, you were? Yeah, I know, I know. I heard your, I, I, I know the missionaries. I, I remember them. My parents told me about the missionaries there. I said, where did you live in Pleiku? He said, I lived in Playbetel, Playbethel, because it's a Christian village. I said, what are you doing here in Kissimmee? You don't have any friends, you don't have a church. He said, I know, I'm so lonely. I'm a refugee. He said, they gave me a job and here I am. I said, well, come to my church. Come to my church at the village. All old people. And he said, I'll come. So he came, but he didn't know too much what was going on. He couldn't understand a lot of it. And he wanted to sing his good songs, you know, the, the uh, Jirai songs that we loved so much. And I said, come home with us. We're gonna call your family. So for my telephone, we called Kissimmee, Florida to play coup, play Batel. And we talked to Jirai. I talked to the, the mother and his little girl, his wife and his little girl. And finally, I said, you, you can't stay here. You can't stay here. I don't want you to stay here. I want you to go to North Carolina. I want you to go up there and find the Jirai Church. It's a living church. It's a church that can teach you and you can have fellowship together with these people. And I want you to go up there. So a few weeks later, I get a phone call. Mom, I've got so many kids around the world, you can't believe it. Mom, I'm in North Carolina. I found the church and I love it here. I said, wonderful, there's nails all around the world. You can fix nails anywhere. They have them in North Carolina too. So there he was fixing nails in North Carolina, but going to the Jirai church. Before I came up here, I got a call from him. Watch the ropes. He said, Mom, God has called me 
to preach. He said, I'm going to Bible school. Oh, hallelujah. I was so excited I could hardly stand. Jet is now studying to be a preacher. Ropes, ropes, ropes. But let me tell you something. When you get my age, I can't go trotting around the world too much. I do want to go to Jordan in May, I hope. But we can't do that. But as we get older, we've got to keep the stakes solid in the ground. We're the ones that have to keep checking the stakes, man the stakes. If we don't man the stakes, those ropes get loose and they feel it at the other end of the world. Now, what is our job? Our job is to have faith in Almighty God. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith, the faith, faith in Almighty God, that post, we can put, drive that stake in the ground and keep it down there where it belongs. Use a, anything you've got, a rock, a hammer, an electric, I don't know, nowadays they're doing all kinds of things. Of course, things change. But, you know, those stakes have to be solidly placed in the ground so that the tent, you get one stake loose. That stake, the air gets in there and the whole tent is affected. Faith in Almighty God. The second, I'm gonna give you a test when I'm done. The first is faith in Almighty God. The second stake is prayer. Believing prayer. Believing that God will answer. Ask and ye shall receive. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. But these are linear words. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. That's what the verse is all about. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaken together and running over. Ask, ask, ask. He's there. And he wants to give it to us. You know, I love the story about Napoleon. He was taking all of Europe, going from one country to another, take another one, take another one, take another one, Napoleon Bonaparte, and he'd go check it out. He said, now we'll take Italy. So his soldiers fought, shed blood to get Italy. And then he said, I want the islands around Italy. So they went out and they took the islands Many died, and he came down to check it out. His generals were standing with him. Good job, good job. And then a young soldier came up to Napoleon Bonaparte, and he said, sir, will you please give me that island? The generals were aghast. How dare he? Napoleon said, Yes, you may have that island. And they said, how can you give him that island? We died to take that island. We had men who shed their blood to get that island. He honors me by the magnitude of his request, was his answer. And the bigger the quest, the bigger the request, the more we honor God. Let's honor him by the magnitude of our request. Ask largely that your joy might be full. Faith in Almighty God, believing prayer. That's our job. We're ending well when we're following these footsteps and seeing that they are these, these posts are solidly placed in the ground. Faith in Almighty God, believing prayer, confidence in the word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is truth. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. Thy word, thy word, thy word. Right now, God's using his word in such a marvelous way. In Iran, just very recently, a young fellow in, in, in prison 
was affected by the word. A fellow came along, I think he was an angel, but I don't know, maybe he wasn't, but anyway. He came along and he shoved this Bible into this prisoner's stomach and he got ready to fight him and he looked in his own Bible, hmm, and this is a book, I have, now I have something to read. So he started reading and he read and he read and he read and he read and it was a Bible. And he read and he read and finally one time a fellow came by and he said, I didn't know you knew English. He said, I don't know any English. Well, you're reading an English Bible. No, I'm not. This is Farsi. That's English. No, it's Farsi. God was translating that Bible for that fella so that he could read the word. I could sit here all day and tell you what God's doing around the world through his word. Ah, the last one I heard the other day. In, in Indonesia, way up in an area where there, were no, uh, there was no witness, a man had a real heart for that, that area but couldn't get in. But they were translating the Bible. They finished translating the Bible in Indonesian, and they had it printed. And when it came from the printers, the pages were twisted sideways, and it was this way instead of this way. So the mission said, we're not paying for that. So all that paper got put in a big basket. All that paper. It wasn't accepted. It had to be straight when we're making the Bible, when we're printing the Bible. Sometime later, probably a couple of years later, somebody came along and said, I hear you have a lot of paper. Can I have some of that paper? I'm going way up north in an area where I came from originally, and uh, I need to make little cones to put peanuts in. And then I'm, I'll sell my peanuts. So they said, well, there's a big basket of paper here you can have. So off he went, took it up there, and he made these cones and put peanuts in them and sold them to the people up in that area that is close to the gospel. Guess what? The scripture is in their hands. And today there's a church in that area. The word, the word, thy word, thy word, all power in thy word. I've got to hurry. Faith in Almighty God, believing prayer, confidence in the word, sanctified giving. Giving, sanctified giving. Yes, you give your tithe. You give your gifts. You give and you give and you help. But sanctified giving goes farther than that. Giving of your time, your love. Giving the gospel out. Giving, 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 giving your heart. Compassion. You know what? Compassion in Asia is translated, your hurt in my heart. That's compassion. Wanting to help, wanting to love, wanting to care, wanting to bring them ultimately to Jesus Christ. That's what our life has to be, whether you live in America or whether you live at the other end of the world. That's our job as we grow older. And everybody we touch, I, my, I go to a... a place very often to, to have my nails done. <laughs> and uh, it, here I am having my nails done, and the Vietnamese are giving me wonderful pho soup. And I'm having my nails done, and they're feeding me soup because they know I love soup. And I keep telling them telling about Jesus. And I give them assignments. They're Buddhists, but that's all right. I love them. I hug them. And they get, I take to them the daily bread in Vietnamese on one side and in English on the other. So whether they read it and then I say, are you reading your book? Are you reading your book? And I tell them about my Savior. No matter how old we get, 91, 95, 100, or 60, or 50, or 40, what we say can affect somebody can affect their lives and the lives of their families. Because we don't have much time left. I know I don't, and you may not either. So, 
we've got to remember to keep those stakes solidly in the ground. Faith in Almighty God. Keep checking it. Believing the Word, sanctified giving, and holy living. Oh, my. Holy living. How important that is. You know, one time I traveled with Grady around. To, he was area director for Southeast Asia in the Middle East and Europe. And I traveled with him, and I, we arrived in Beirut just when my mother and father were having a graduation for the Bible school. And the, the, the girls were all really excited. There were a lot of girls, and there were a lot of guys. And, and I knew that they would have to have something on their heads, so I bought them all little white hats, little white, just little tiny hats to put on their heads because they couldn't go in without something on their heads. So uh, I bought these little white hats, and while I was dressing them and fixing their faces and just getting them all ready for the, being gra graduating from their Bible school, I said, what was your favorite subject? And they looked at me and they said, your mother's life. She was on her knees much of the time. Daddy was an iron man. We kids were Indian rubber balls. And mother was on her knees. She had to be. Here her girls were in America. She never met her husbands before we married them. I even had, we all had children before she ever met the, met the husbands, let alone the children. But she found our husbands on her knees. And it was like a rope around my middle. I came home when I was 16 years old and I didn't know one thing from, I didn't know anything. And I arrived in America and I'd always thought of America as a little island with a dime store in the middle with lots of red hearts. That's about what I thought about America. And I arrived home as this huge America. Arrived at Wheaton where my sister was. And from there I went to Nyack. And I fell into the arms of the most wonderful guy in the world. The rope was around my waist. Tugging, tugging, keeping me. She was an example of holy living. I'm a weeper, I'm sorry. Holy living, depending upon the Lord, lonely, but on fire. She sang, she sang. Now what do we do? Our lives are coming to an end. Our this era is coming to an end. Pay your debts, get them done. Arrange for your funeral early. My husband died two years ago and I didn't have to pay one penny because it was all paid for. It took us 10 years, but we took it all taken care of. I didn't have to pay, I didn't have to go into debt for anything. Of course, I sold the, the, um, the, um, Place, the place where, but we bought another one in the meantime. So I have a place to go when I'm done. But anyway, all of that was taken care of. Make amends. Tell your children you love them. Talk to them. Divide your treasures between them before you die so they don't fight over stuff. Do all of this. End well, end well, so that when you're through, you have a united family. You have a, a good reputation. You have a life ahead of you. Uh, you're leaving a life behind that they can think of as a good example to them. You know, every year we try to do something. I make I made boxes with with um, promise boxes for the children. They pull out a promise and they open it. They love it. But it's scripture, scripture, scripture. Then a few years ago, we gave out this. I will set no evil thing before my eyes. And I said, put it under your TV. So all my grandchildren have these under your TV. Tom's daughter, her oldest, she, she said, oh, Nana, I need another one because we have two TVs now. A second one. I will set no evil thing before my eyes. Influence, 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 encourage, love. Pay attention and leave a heritage behind 
stakes, man the stakes, every one of them. That's our job as we get older, since we can't go to the ends of the world right now. We don't have the strength to go. But as we man the stakes, that's even more important. The VC took us off the road in Vietnam with all my family, took us into the, uh, down a logging trail, and I was scared to death. I remember thinking, oh, thank the Lord, I know how to drive there. I know they'll take my boys and, and my husband. We got in there, and while we were in there, a retired missionary in Deland, Florida, was on the roof of his house, raking the leaves off, fixing a hole of something. And God spoke to him, get down off the roof, get down on your knees, get your wife and pray for Grady and Evelyn, they're in trouble right now. And he did what he was supposed to do. And he went down and they prayed together and they wrote us and said, what in the world happened? We were in with the VC. They took people that day, but they let us go. And I remember Tom, he says, Oh, am I glad the Lord was with us. That's our job. Even at age 91 or 95 or 50, we can be in contact with the Holy Spirit because in ourselves we have nothing. We are nothing. But as the Holy Spirit works through us, it can touch lives. We can support those that are out there. Here we have the ropes, clear to the ends of the earth, ee -e, to the ends of the earth. And they're still going farther and farther and farther. Educated, young people, older people. But there comes a time when we have to mind the stakes. They're minding them all the time, but we take double, double duty. Faith in Almighty God, believing prayer, confidence in the word, sanctified giving and holy living. Now, let me tell you what it's included in holy living. We must remember that we must do away with criticism. I made a list of things we've got to throw out if we're going to honor God. Fomenting disunity. Complaining. Oh, my land. Every time you get in the car, oh, there's so many red lights. I love red lights. They give you time to think. They give you time to see what the houses and the trees. And I can't understand why everybody hates red lights. And anyway, the person that's coming to cross, they want to get out too. All sunshine makes a desert. And we need some things to keep us going, to keep us checking our attitudes. And then we have to hunt for unity. Unity in the spirit. Watch out for criticism. Um, you know, I live with people, a lot of older people, and I heard behind me the other day, when the preacher goes over 20 minutes, I turn it off. I thought, oh, dear, touch not my anointed. And I told her later, you know, I said, oh, you know, in Vietnam, you just go on and on and on, and you're there. they feel like they're getting cheated if you only talk for 20 minutes. They love the word. I'll never forget one fella. An American came out to speak, and I think Tom Stebbins was doing the interpreting. I don't remember who exactly, but he came, and the, the, the church had been blown apart by, in the war, so they were out under a coconut, in a coconut grove, and there were coconut trees all around. And uh, the American came and he thought, mm, now I'm gonna have to get, to, you know, I'm gonna get them uh, interested and so I'm gonna talk about coconuts a little bit. And he said, oh, these coconut trees are so beautiful. He said, you take the leaves and you make your houses and put it on your roof. And then you take a coconut and you break it and then you drink the juice and you eat the meat. And then you take the outside and you make shoes and you, you use them as fish scrubbers and on and on. A lady stood up. They were out on the field, they were sitting on the ground. She stood up, she said, Pastor, will you please tell that man that we know all there is to know about coconuts? We want the word. Tell him to give us the word. We want the truth. 
You know, truth and love walk God together. Truth without love is abrasive. And love without truth That's not for us. So all of us must remember that we must watch what we say and realize that everything we say can affect other people. And then there's the gossip. Oh, my land, gossip. That's not for us. That's not for us. Criticism, that's not for us. Away with it. Choose joy. Choose joy. Choose song. Choose music. Choose celebration. <laughs> I love to celebrate. I made a cake one day when I realized it was Mother's birthday. And so I made a cake and candles, and the kids came home, and they said, Oh, whose birthday is it? I said, It's Mother's birthday. They said, July the 7th. I said, Mother's birthday? Your mother? She's been dead for years. Oh, I don't care. I'm going to celebrate my mother. They think I'm crazy, but I love to celebrate. When we get older, that's important. Choose joy. Choose to celebrate. Choose to love. You know, I'm getting blind. I can hardly see, and I can't even see my notes. But I do know one thing, that very often... There are S-curves in our lives. S-curves in the ropes are in our lives. There are times when things are going just fine, and then there's an S-curve. When your leader, Kennedy, passed away, that was an S-curve. Things had to stop for a minute. There had to be rethinking, reworking, a new, a new leader. There are S-curves in all of our lives. When my husband died, that was an S-curve for me. But if all were easy, if all were bright, where would the cross be? Where would the fight? It's in the hard places God gives to you. Choosing what God, seeing what God can do for, for you. You know, if we have trials of many kinds, James says, count yourself supremely happy in the knowledge that such testing of your faith breeds fortitude. And if you give fortitude good, good play, you will go on to complete a balanced character that will fall short in nothing. So these S-curves are very important. They're, they're where the diamonds are. They're when you feel like you're at the bottom of the ocean, that's where the pearls are. And in these S-curves, that's when God can speak to us, can change our attitudes can make us realize that he has something better for all of us, that our attitudes can be pleasing to him, and that we can find joy and song. I remember Daddy in the middle of the desert on Camelback. He'd sing, There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Or he would be singing, Oh, how I love Jesus. All of these songs in the middle of the desert, he was discouraged, wondered who he would find next, what tent would accept him, what tent would not. And yet he found that the glory of the Lord was there and that he had a message for these wonderful people. That's why I love them. And I love the Vietnamese. Oh, my land, my heart's so full of everything, you can't believe it. I've got, I love the Arabs. I love the Vietnamese, the Chinese. Oh, my. Uh, we had two years in, China, in Hong Kong. I, oh, they're fantastic people. And I'll, live, I'll love them forever. And I have friends, that, even to this day, that write me and call me on the telephone all the time. These are wonderful people all over the world, people who love Jesus, and every one of them can be a witness. Every one of them can be a rope. Every one of them can be manning the stakes. Faith in Almighty God, believing prayer, confidence in the word, sanctified giving, and holy living. Let me tell you something. The king of Saudi Arabia uh, heard about Rolls Royces and he wanted to have some Rolls Royces. So he ordered nine Rolls Royces from England to come to Saudi Arabia, Riyadh. 
And so he wanted these nine for his sons and for his nephews. And so he said, now, let me tell you, I want the hip caps gold, and I want the handles gold, and I want the trim gold, and I want all of these to arrive at about the same time. So one day, here they come, nine Rolls Royces into Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And he said, and I want books to tell us all about them, the manuals. So they all gathered together and they read the books first. He said, you can't drive until you read the books. So they were read, reading and reading and reading. And of course, all of them had horses. And so they said, hmm, how many horsepower does one of these have? Horsepower? Look at the book. Nowhere in the book would it say how many horsepower in that, in that car. So the king of Saudi sent a telegram to England, to London. How many horsepower in these Rolls Royces? And they waited and they waited. Finally, they got an answer from the company. One word, adequate. That was enough. And I thought, when I heard that story, I thought, that's exactly what God is to me. He is adequate, adequate for my every need in trying to encourage the people I live with, in trying to bring those that don't know him to him, to the Lord. And I can't do it in my own strength. Can't see. But I can talk and I can give them the word and I could keep those stakes in the ground solid so that the, ta the tent won't go down with the winds and the persecution that so many are experiencing these days around the world, especially over in Iran, Iraq, and Syria. Syria, oh, Syria. I lived there for so many. In fact, every time I would come home from school, from Jerusalem to go home, I'd we'd go to a different village. They moved all the time. So these people that don't want to move because their kids have to go to a different village, forget it. We moved. It was mother and daddy I wanted to see. I didn't care where we lived. So we'd go to these different towns and villages. And every time I'd go home, I'd see what God is doing. And a new church had established. Then he'd move on to another, another church established, another, 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 all over Syria. A few months ago, I went to, to our council in uh, Tampa, Florida. And I came out of a session with my daughter, Patty, and I heard Arabic singing. And I thought, that's Arabic. So I, could, I didn't know where they were, and so I gave the trill. The trill that is given when at a wedding or if you win a battle, you know, just like that. And they came running. And I, they said, Who are you? I said, I'm Evelyn Braden, Mangum. Braden, your daddy won my father to the Lord. Your daddy won my grandfather to the Lord. Your mother won my dad. My, and I tell you, we were hugging and kissing and hugging and crying because here was a wonderful answer to what God can do. And here they were in Tampa, from California, most of them, starting churches here in America among the Arabs. I thought, I've arrived because I saw what God can do. And I just want to keep hanging on to those stakes and just keep pounding them down and being sure they're solid in the ground so that the tent can go farther and farther and farther. And then God will be glorified. That's what it's all about. Not so that Evelyn will have a name, not so that the missionaries will have a name, not so that the EE -E people will have a name, but that God will be glorified and we'll all meet together in heaven. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. <laughs>